Epic Gamer 4 here with another video. Today, I'll be showing you how to create an offline profile in Windows 10. Now, let's get right into it, right after a word from our sponsors, Raid Shadow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, kids of all ages, this is a last minute matriarchy. It's Wednesday, everybody. We all knew it was coming, and none of us prepared. None of us meaning me, mostly. So, today, we are doing... Oh, I should introduce our today's panel of guests. We've got regulars. We've got the, the, the second week of the medal's triumphant return. <clears throat> and we are featuring, of course, uh, everyone's uh, favorite cartoonicus. Stay tuned. Kids of all ages. All that kind of stuff. It's I uh, prefer to be called an irregular. The irregular? <laughs> The irregular return of the metal. And anti-regular. <clears throat> Ooh, there you go. Irregular as in not frequently here or as in the Baker Street irregular? In, just in general. Oh, in general. Okay. I was trying to decide what kind of uh, reference you were making there. A recurring villain. <laughs> this week's guest villain, right? What is that was they used on the old Batman series? Yeah. <laughs> Instead of guest star, it was guest villain. Is that what that was? I can't even remember anymore. It's been so long since I watched those. Well, anyway, depends. would you say you have a uh, a rogues gallery? No, no, I, I'm just hated by occasional people. <laughs> I'm not even saying I'm not even trying to say that it's unjustified. So that's a whole different story. I am the only human face on the show, though, so that's worth something. Anyway, tonight we are, 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 are doing an Ask Me Anything because um, our other topics didn't pan out or we had panel members that couldn't make it. And so we were just kind of going with it as it goes. So first of all, the very first thing we're going to do today is a little game. And it's, it's what's Reese's problem. So I have a screenshot from over here. You should have this a little... what's Reese's problem this time. Yeah, what's the Reese's problem this time? Yeah, yeah, not not in general. Not what's my general problem. Like my microphone was too far down or something like that. Um but no, what is what is what what does why why is this? Here's an image that was on my Facebook. And I said, Oh, that's sad. And so the question is, why is this so sad? Right? That's the question I've got. So as I said off uh, screen, uh, if I had any idea who this was, or if I had seen either Deadpool movie, I'd probably. Okay. Well, then you will not be able to tell me what you think is wrong. <laughs> That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, how about, how about you, a uh, metal? I know you had, you had a guess. Well, I, I kind of knew it wasn't your problem. I was saying what my problem was. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Which is like, I, I hardly consider her a star of the movie. But we use that word so um, flippantly now that like anybody who is in a movie, even if they're just like on screen as a cameo for f three minutes, is a mm -hmm. star of the movie. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, she didn't really have enough screen time for me to really say she's a star of the movie. Yeah. Of yeah. either of them. <sighs> yeah. Well, and, and we're not having anybody in the chat yet, at least as far as I, as I am seeing. So uh, this game isn't going to be a lot of fun if we don't have people participating. So I guess that I'm just going to have to go ahead and explain why I this is why this image made me so sad. And it was largely because uh, Mona Bakarin was absolutely one of the drawing features in Firefly uh, okay. as the escort. In Firefly, and that is really usually name. what she would oh, go to her? cons as. But yep, yep, that, that is that is the gal who was yeah. uh, uh, I, I I don't know, I can't remember the character's name. It's been too long since I saw Firefly, <laughs> but her character was yeah, one she of the was the um, right? quote unquote uh, escort. Yeah, yeah, she's one of the standouts uh, in Firefly in, in terms of the character and the the moral dilemmas that it all presented and how they built the world, and even though and her personal relationship and uh, her personal with relationship Mal. with the other characters, right. And, well, specifically um, Mal, right? Well, specifically Mal, she was kind I mean, of like, like even, the love interest type character. Well, yeah, but even her like taking on the mother role to the to the other girls and all that other kind of stuff that was all part of of the, the dynamics they have in there. Um, and uh, I know not everybody likes Firefly, but I really do. 
for very very I do too many reasons. Um, and there's lots of there's lots to not like about Firefly. Like for example, Joss Whedon's like creepy exploitative uh, <laughs> like that he like works into all of his pieces, and like how how people didn't see that he was like while professing to be a feminist was actually like an absolute lech for his entire career. Like why people didn't see that coming? Because um, that's all of Hollywood. It is all of Hollywood, but it's also really funny because it's just like like. Uh, I mean, it's just like in all of his stuff, there's this weird, like, exploitative aspect to every one of his work. Mm. See, my problem with Firefly is that they weren't able to keep the network happy, so we only really got like one season in a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the movie was had some really great like moments, Serenity. but was overall kind of mid. I'm a leaf on the wind. <laughs> see, see, Wash got done dirty, man. <laughs> I was gonna say the fact that the only meme to come out of that movie. <laughs> Is like every, the one of the biggest too soon moments in all of history. Well, that's not the only one. The other one was uh, the "Can't Stop the Signal." Yeah, yeah, that, which was which is probably the the most true thing Joss Whedon ever wrote. <laughs> the other thing well, is there's just like some really good scenes. Like yeah, when, yeah there uh, are there are the river just goes like to town on mm -hmm. hordes of people at once. It's <sighs> great. Well, yeah, and her build up as this like killing machine was done pretty well right so like yeah. it doesn't smack of a of a uh, mary sue in the slightest because no no this is a, a person who was basically built for this you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. and she's going through trauma her yeah. brother's trying to like save her from it and it's like she's she's not even technically good at this yet it's all like more reflex and instinct and right. it kind of just kicks well, and they take time. the time the, the series took the time to explain that um, even though they were cut short on it, there were still lots of explaining that got done in the series if you were paying attention. Oh yeah, I like yeah, I've probably, probably watched my favorite the episode seven or eight times. So my favorite episode is still the one where they get boarded, right? And River basically like becomes the ship. Like she starts speaking from the perspective of the ship. Oh yeah, yeah. Freaking out. Like that's such a good episode. My my, <laughs> uh, I think my favorite. Uh, one of my favorites is Shindig when Mal goes to the 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 the, the debutante Southern Ball <laughs> on the on the Confederacy planet, and, yeah. <laughs> um, which is also really ironic since uh, uh, the uh, Joss Whedon is a giant um, uh, uh, lib um, dem. Yeah. Um, Escape Claude is also kind of a ripoff of Outlaw Star. I, I do not seen agree. It. Um, mm. not, though well, I, I could see the arguments, it is definitely at least heavily influenced by Outlaw Star, uh, but also Outlaw Star is better. So if you like Firefly, you should go and watch the the anime for Outlaw Star. Like it's it's good. Well, and 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 here so and here's part of the thing is is that is Wayden admittedly was intentionally ripping off Star Wars, right? Um, in terms of the yes. attitude toward the ship, you know, how mm. he, uh, Mal is absolutely without question Han Solo. It's not even not even in 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 debate at all. Um, but it's a it's a combination of influences, mm. right? Right. Like well, I wouldn't even be surprised if Outlaw Star was one of the influences because uh, he's said even going like way back that he was interested in like anime. So mm -hmm. it's like yeah. Well, and that, that's what well, that's what I was actually getting around to is like. Um, I was uh, I was a huge huge fan of Firefly, um, uh, and I remain a, a fan of Firefly. But I was a huge huge fan of Firefly um, up until I saw Cowboy Bebop, and <laughs> I realized yeah. that 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 everything that wasn't Star Wars in in uh, the uh, like everything that wasn't Star Wars in Firefly was in fact in Cowboy Bebop. Yeah. <laughs> and I was and and Cowboy Bebop came out before Firefly went into production. Well, so, so. Th those two are kind of contemporary. I think Outlaw Star might be like a year or two older or whatever, but like both mm -hmm. Cowboy Bebop and Outlaw Star have a lot of overlap uh, with mm -hmm. each other. And usually there's a lot of people who are always arguing about the two shows. It's like if you like one, you'll probably like the other though. There's really yeah. no point well, in arguing. I, I'm already interested now. I, I don't think I was I don't I know I haven't seen it and I'm not sure. I think I've heard people talk about it in passing, but I've never had a chance to see Outlaw Star. But um I'm already interested. <laughs> so yeah. where where can I find this? 
for, for um, I've got sources. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, we'll, we'll yeah. discuss this in the green room. Um, yeah, I would be. I would definitely be interested to, to catch that out. Um, so. <clears throat> Ooh, hey, uh, Escape Cloud, I think we've sparked something. Haven't watched it in a long time. Need to dig out the DVDs. Excellent. Excellent. Go back to those physical medias and, and check them out. Always in favor of, of, of rediscovering our good stuff. Yeah. I, I would probably say between the two. Uh, I mean, there's big differences as well. But while they both have a good amount of drama and comedy in it, Outlaw Star is slightly funnier and Cowboy Bebop is slightly more dramatic. Okay, okay. Now, when you say slightly, uh, because we're talking about anime here, how off the rails... What I mean is, like, they're still in the same genre. It's not enough that it pulls them out of uh, the same genre as each other. (laughs) Yeah, Cowboy Bebop has lots of of comedy. Oh, yeah, it's super funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, this this is a fact. Um, Claude says, I tried watching an old DVD last week and the disc was corrupted. That's the problem with physical media. Yes. Actually, last week, this is crazy. Last week, um, my we my family and I had sat down to watch um, Dirty Harry. Actually, that was two weeks ago. We sat down and watched Dirty Harry. And last week, we're like, hey, let's go check out the second film, which I forget the name of at the minute. Um I can't remember. It doesn't matter right now. But anyway, so we're going to watch um, the, the, the second uh, Dirty Harry flick. Uh, and Magnum we go to put Force. it. Magnum Force, that's right. We go to put it in our DVD player, or we have a Blu ray player upstairs. We go to put it in the Blu ray player, and it won't play. And the, the thing says it's playing, but no sound is coming out. It's just a black screen. We take it out. We dust off the disc, make sure it's all good and clean. We put it back in, and then it starts playing. <laughs> but it's no screen the screen is black and with the volume turned up you can hear it play like three seconds every nine seconds <laughs> right so it's so it's going along and you're hearing the audio track but it's not consistent it's like you, you hear three seconds of music and then it skips nine seconds and three more seconds of music that is you know nine you know that nine seconds later or whatever so it was yeah. i don't know if then, so we took the thing down to our downstairs in our in uh, I, in our, my bedroom. I've got a DVD player, like an old DVD player. Doesn't even have a HDMI cable. That's how old this thing is. It's still got the RCA jacks, and uh, it'll play down here, but it's not coded in a way that our upstairs player will read it. And yeah, so, yeah, and it's a problem when things went digital, right? Yep. Like obviously, you still have the corruption issue of different ways mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. Um, more analog uh, types of media but when things went fully digital it's like everything has to be encoded properly uh, for mm-hmm. whatever player that you have Yep, <clears throat> and whatever codec that the older DVDs were using the new one doesn't and it's a whole thing I noticed that with two with um, uh, my, my DVD player upstairs won't read um, X-Men the uh, the original I have I have the original pressing of the X Men, and mm, my downstairs okay. one will, but I can't I can't watch it on the Blu Ray player. Yep. So I, I still like have a, a, a VCR. The this is just the way they keep forcing us to go to whatever ver- next version exists, so they can sell it to us again. Sometimes, sometimes. Uh, maybe now. I, I know the older ones; they weren't doing that intentionally at all. Like, because honestly, the industry had no idea what it was doing when these codecs first came out. They were just kind of like, "Oh, it's digital now. We can do everything digital," and everything just kept growing so fast. And people came up with better things that they didn't think about the fact that like the next player won't be able to play this old uh, device. By the time we get to Blu-ray, though, they kind of knew what they were doing. So after that point, it's probably intentional. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the thing, or just or just poor quality control. Oh, like, I have, <clears throat> I bought I bought the, the the two disc version of of Battle Angel Alita, and the Blu-ray has always been buggy, and I meant to take it back and return it, and I just didn't. I just got myself busy, and the, but the, because the D, I, I mean, I bought it and I put it in the player, and the Blu-ray wouldn't work right because there's something wrong with it, and um. Uh, 
oh yeah <laughs> It, it got all and it got all weird, but I put it in the DVD and it played fine. And so then I felt satisfied because I got to watch the movie I bought, right? <laughs> okay. And then I just set it on the shelf and I'm like, oh, next week I'll go back to Walmart. I've got the receipt next week, next week, next week. And pretty soon it was like three years later. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> yes. Um, Claude says, uh, thanks for your activity in the chat there, Claude. Uh, Claude. Claude says, uh, remember Div X literal disposable dvds that either died in three days or you could pay and buy it and have them activated over the phone um i don't uh, yes, ever I do remember these i don't ever remember being offered the chance to activate it i figured it was a chemical like like you open it up like because they, they had an air seal at least the ones that i'm thinking of you had an air seal and you open it up and um and then after a while it, it quit working so i just figured that they had some sort of chemical on them and they just would wear out over time so after 40 years, quite literally, this disc will self-destruct. Well, not a 40 years. <laughs> oh, I, I see. 40 oh, yeah. years from the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. from the from the mystery science. I mean, the Mission Impossible thing. But uh, no, uh, if if you were savvy, if you were tech savvy, and you had a DVD player in your computer in those earlier days, which I did. Uh, and you knew what you're doing, you could activate those DVDs yourself. <laughs> uh, Pirating. Uh, Mrs. H says, you know a medium that never failed to play? Laser disc. Laser disc. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a reason for that, is because laser disc was so was was um first of all, it's not compressed. Um the data would didn't didn't have to be compressed. Um uh and so that that was one issue. So you didn't have the same kind of codec issues. It could be un that's why they had to be 12 inches big because they were uncompressed video data. Um, and that was one issue. And the second issue was that the technology was static, and so it didn't uh um uh it didn't it didn't have a chance to be need to be updated in the same yeah, way. It never it never outgrew itself. Yep. Yeah, like um, with D blue DVDs, they kept trying to figure out new ways to compress the data and to get extra features on them and not, and right. everything else, and then um and 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 try to c end cut the eventual move to because even before DVDs were reveal were released as a thing, um, <clears throat> Blu-ray technology had been developed. <clears throat> so there was actually a debate in the late '90s about whether um, movie companies would would even release DVDs, um. Um, because Blu-rays were on their way to being product tested. Yeah. Um, well, so because the person, who, the company that owns the patent for Blu-ray <laughs> is Sony. Mm -hmm. uh, Sony happens to have that. Even they waited uh, for quite a while uh, because they could have been using it for all, all, the entire PlayStation 2 era. That could have been the discs that they used for their um, games. And they decided to hold off on it. And I, if I recall, I think it had something to do with the, the fact that at the time it was still more expensive to make <clears throat> Blu-ray discs than it was regular like DVDs. Yep. Yep. That was I part hate, of it. I hate the name though because clearly both DVDs and Blu-rays are laser discs. Do you yeah. hate the name I mean, laser disc? Yeah. No, just how like all these things have different names, even though. They're all, all discs. Of them use, use lasers, lasers to read. Like even uh, the compact disc, the CD, is also a laser disc in yeah. a way. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I can agree with that from like a a pedantic um, perspective. Um, but the reason I, I, um, I mean, at the same time, they're not the same technology, right? No, and um, language and is so functional. So once some, we name something, as long as everybody knows the name, it's fine. Yep. No, the crazy thing for me is when I is is when they had the big battle, the big conflict between HD DVDs and Blu-ray. And Blu-ray, it's because Microsoft and, didn't want to pay the patent price to Sony. Right, and so so they they had they, they were using red lasers, and so all the thing is crazy was all of the packaging was like color coded, so you wouldn't <laughs> accidentally pick up the wrong product. Well, and HD DVDs couldn't hold as much like storage mm -hmm. on it as a Blu-ray could. So like right. I remember right. Final Fantasy the wavelength 13. Of red laser is, is wider, yeah. so you actually Final Fantasy 13 a... comes out, and on PlayStation you only needed one disc for the entire game. On Xbox you needed like five. And that, wow. that was just because of how big the game was. And people were like, what? 
there's no way the difference could be that much. It's like, yes, Blu-ray could just hold that much data. Like, they yeah. pretty much never filled a Blu-ray disc mm -hmm. on the PlayStation 3 era. Mm -hmm. I always laugh how, how that kind of stuff goes on between Sony and Microsoft. And then, you know, Nintendo is just over here just playing with Mario. Fair. It's like, fair. disc? What's a disc? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, then Nintendo was, uh, they got into the disc game with the... Uh... GameCube from GameCube. They did, and they chose the sm world's smallest disc. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nintendo has always foregone graphics in favor of gameplay. They're well, like, we don't need that. Was actually for have... piracy purposes, right? They well, thought if they use these smaller discs, it, people it would be harder for people to actually mount stuff onto it because they'd have to get the discs, and then those started becoming widely available because the GameCube started using the disc uh -huh. size. And then it was bad for mounting once they started going vertical with the Wii, so they went back to the larger discs anyway that everybody else was using. Well, sure, and, they did it once. Well, but that, even well, again, well, even now we're back to cartridges. So Point is, they don't care about graphics. They care about gameplay. Um, yeah, for they, the most part. Uh, they did yeah. care during the GameCube era. I think they have the best R&D out of like any company with this stuff. I've had this theory that they have seen the graphics wall that their people are racing to like a couple decades ago and they mm -hmm. decided we're gonna we don't need to race towards the graphics wall it's better just to make more fun games um but that's not the reason why they went back to cartridge they went back to cartridge because there's always been a race between flash memory and disc and flash memory has far uh surpassed anything you can put on a disc now like it's never probably never going to catch up again yeah true yeah um, I actually had a I had a buddy who um, was involved uh, on, on the research science that ended up um, not directly. His research wasn't direct designed for that, but they ended up becoming co-opted by data science. So um, <clears throat> my my buddy was a student at UNL, and he was um, working in the science labs as a tech for his his student employment, and they were building machines to to um, um, make micro particles, right? Um, and they're they're <clears throat> so they're finding ways of 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 using um, different kinds of machining techniques and different kinds of energy manipulation techniques to generate micro particles out of bar stock. And their goal was um, that what they were looking for, the application they were looking for, was for a way to use um, uh, microscopic gold pellets in medicine. Um, because they because because uh gold's uh inert um on medically and so the idea of was using it as a as a launching platform for um like uh, uh antiviruses and retroviruses <clears throat> and so that's what they were trying to do but the, that research was the same stuff that was ended up being used for sd um and micro sd technology down the road because they developed ways of making these hyper micro microized particles that could then be manipulated into micro storage yeah and, because um flash <laughs> storage is basically just a battery right it's yep. a bunch of tiny little power cells that mm -hmm. can encode things similar to uh doing it in um binary but you can actually get uh, basically super positions with it because the battery doesn't have to be full or empty you can actually have it like in a, a halfway point where it fills or empties when it needs to be read it's really cool what you can do with flash memory mm -hmm. so yeah, so that was actually one of the, that, that's there you go, uh, the eleven uh, degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever, the, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. But um, so, uh, Scape Claude asks, this was not the questions that I had intended for today's show. Um, was HD DVD an open format like how VHS won over Betamax, even though it was supposedly inferior tech, because it was the open standard not owned by Sony? I don't know. Do either of you guys know? I do not think HD DVD was inherently open. Mm -hmm. I think it was cheaper, but it still lost out. Like, yeah, I, mean, I, th I think it had more to do with the fact that um, Blu-ray technology, um, the, the actual blue lasers, just had more flexibility with what could be stored. Yeah. And so that... That's... But I also think it's because of the previous generation of video game uh, consoles, which has almost nothing to do with video games as to why it was popular, right? One of the most popular video game consoles of all time 
is the PlayStation 2. And the reason the PlayStation 2 is so popular is because DVD players were so expensive when they first came out that the cheapest DVD player you could get was a PlayStation 2. So people who weren't even gamers got into gaming because they owned a PlayStation 2 to be able to play DVDs. And because of that, it also built like this really huge audience for Sony. And a lot of people upgraded to PlayStation 3, especially when they heard that like, um, Netflix was going to start streaming and not just DVDs and you could get the app over here on your uh, PlayStation and it started becoming like a media hub and I think like Sony just becoming the media hub for the living room is what made Blu-rays more popular than HD DVDs hmm hmm well, that's something I thought of but I know I can't I can't really argue with you on that and and uh, um, I know one of the reasons that for my wife's always always been a gamer. And so one of the reasons we were really fond of the PS2 as well was that it was backwards compatible for most um Oh yeah, yeah. You can play like pretty much any PlayStation yeah, yeah. game on there, yeah. Yeah, I'd be mean, like my X-Files game will not play on a PS2, but part of that's because of the way the graphics are compiled, um it'll play, but the graphics don't line up between the live action bits and mm -hmm. the computer generated bits. They're like Do you have a slim each other? I'm sorry, what? Uh, do you have a slim, like a PS2 slim? Or uh, yes. The launch model? Yeah. Okay, that's mm -hmm. why. Because like the launch model ones, uh, they had more hardware in them and mm. it would compensate for those problems. Like that's all right. PS1 right. games are backwards compatible with the launch model. Slim, some of them weren't. That's right. And actually we did have a launch model. Um, we almost picked it up on our honeymoon, but we decided to wait six months because it was, they were so, they were kind of buggy. We, you know, we had that wedding money and <laughs> the honeymoon money, and we're like, let's just get one. We're like, ah, oh, what if it's crap? And I don't want to be sending it back and forth to Sony for six months. Um, at least better than PlayStation 3, right? Because PlayStation 3, the launch version of it literally had a PS1 in there, mm -hmm. so it was backwards compatible fully with PS1 games, not PS2. But then after like several uh editions later, it wasn't like it stopped being like backwards compatible at all. <laughs> well, that's funny. Yeah, we had um we had a situation um when, we, when the PS3 came out, we were just we, we had, you know, by that time we had two kids and the idea of spending that much money on a game console suddenly didn't seem rational anymore. So we were looking to buy a house and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you could never... buy a PlayStation or a house, which will it be? Yeah, well, yeah, sort of. <laughs> um we uh yeah, so that was that was a sort of how it worked out there. Um <sighs> Uh, Fizz says on the subject of this still, um, from what I heard, someone had been saying that they had developed super DVDs, yet streaming basically replaced it. I think that's probably accurate too. Um, I yeah. don't know that we'll see. I don't know that we'll see any great uh, leap forward in the uh, uh, physical medium because streaming is oh, so maybe. accessible. But it won't necessarily be a great leap forward. I think people who want physical. It's, it's probably even going to be carts. Like, we're going to get, like, sd size car, si uh carts, like how Nintendo does their cartridge, and that will probably have it on, because it's pretty cheap to just make those tiny flash carts now. Um, and it, it easier for storage. You, if you don't care about the boxes, and the boxes mm. are smaller as well, but if you don't care about the boxes, you could store, like, hundreds of them in the same bag uh, without even worrying about it. Just good luck finding yep. it afterwards. Um, that's fair. Yeah. But it's convenience. That's That's the real thing. A mm -hmm. lot of people, they they don't care enough to want the physical media. They just want to watch the thing, and it's just more convenient to have everything in a digital library. The, the thing I like about, about physical media still is the idea that it's the, that I can get it when I want it. I don't have to mm -hmm. wait till it has to be available or, or keep paying somebody a fee to have access to stuff I want you, month after month. worry about them deleting it all of a sudden. Mm. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Um, yep. Claude says flash memory carts aren't super durable long term either. Yeah, uh, the modern ones are definitely way better than they used to be. But flash memory mm -hmm. is uh, subjective uh, or sub to degradation more so mm -hmm. than like hard disk is. Yep. Um, even your like solid state drive in your computer is going to probably go out f faster than an older hard disk will. And part of that is the nature of the power cells, mm -hmm. right? You know, like it'll just you'll lose the ability to store over time. But it takes like a long time. Yeah, and it depends on how well it's how often it's used. And like that's one of those things they say with solid state drives, you're not supposed to defrag them because there's only a certain number of writes each sector has on it. Yeah. So which is terrifying <laughs> to me. <laughs> well, that's why you just go 
because you can still get uh hdd right mm -hmm. you just you you build a like a media storage unit right that, that's all it does you can hook it up to your wi-fi and then you just put a bunch of like terabytes of hdd in there and that's your backup storage for everything you don't have to worry about that dying on you so much yep, yep. makes sense makes sense so uh, we do have a question from the chat. Uh, I did. I didn't see it. I wasn't skipping on any there. Fizz says, "Will an adult audience watch a film where the characters are all robots?" Um, yes, every movie is. They're all robots. They, they call them actors, yeah. but they, they really just they they don't really have any will or mind of their own. And I also think movie, the movie Robots was more popular among adults than kids. So we watched that. Actually, that was really funny. Really funny you bring that up because we um. Uh, we watched that when the kids were small. Oh, you beat me to that joke. <laughs> um, oh, here we go. Robots have more soul than Hollywood actors. Ooh, fair. Yeah. We watched Robots when the kids were small, and um, Talias and my my youngest would he had a, one of those Robbie robot stuffed dolls. Mm -hmm. He would carry around with him everywhere, and he was fascinated with robots. Not the movie, the concept of robots when he was young. And he had two robot toys. One was an old, like, 1970s square plastic stuffed toy. It was like, 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 like fake vinyl. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was like, but it was a, it was a, it was a square headed robot with a little antenna off the top of it. And that Robbie the robot. And he would just carry his robots around. And then when we would have like a Saturday or whatever, we would watch, sit down and watch Mystery Science, he would run to his room and come back with his robot pals so they could sit mm. and watch Mystery Science. <laughs> <laughs> and he called that he called the show robot pals that's what he's uh, <laughs> it's a good name for the show it's a good name for the show yeah. good name for the show no, I, I understand that because i used to watch power rangers and it's like if i was watching yeah. it i wanted to have like my megazords with me while i was watching mm -hmm. the show mm -hmm. so like I, I, I can relate oh yeah oh yeah it's you know normal kid behavior yeah or like transformers i used to have transformers too i'd want them next if i was watching transformers absolutely i remember i remember those days twice um, but yeah, so back to the question though, um, uh, I, it, uh, robots definitely, um, was popular with adults. Um, we went back, oh, I was gonna tell another story about it. Uh, the other, the other week, my, my, my oldest has been, this has been a while back ago, but he got on a kick of watching, um, he did the, he did the dark side of the moon wizard of Oz thing. He's like, well, what other movies? Can go with Dark Side of the Moon, <laughs> and so he just started trying to pick movies and concept albums and pairing them up together. And uh, if you've never tried that, try watching Dark Side of the Moon, listening to Dark Side of the Moon while watching Casablanca. It's it's fascinating. Um, but uh, but he, I was going to say uh, watching Dark, uh, listening to Dark Side of the Moon with uh, Disney's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, the original cartoon version. Oh yeah. That would be good too. That would be good too, and uh, I can't remember they did. They did. Um, I can't remember what movie it was. Oh wait, it was. Um, it was the with robots. We we um last it was last autumn, and we watched robots while we listened to. Um, well, I can't remember the name of the of the um, Daft Punk. One of the Daft Punk albums. Uh, I can't remember which one it was, but my my youngest is a. Is the, the who was fixated on robots is also a big fan of Daft Punk, and so <laughs> and so we listened to one of the Daft Punk albums where we watched robots. So I've recently seen it, but I didn't actually hear what was going on. <laughs> They're the people who did uh, Tron, right? Tron, I really loved. Uh, uh, yeah, they did the music for the Tron, uh, the second Tron movie. Now, does Tron count as a movie where all the characters are robots? Uh, no. Uh... Only it's some not of the Interstellar five 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 was it? Oh, yeah. I can't remember what the oh, which which because oh, okay. Interstellar five 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 is the one where uh, they basically took the whole album and they made a uh, an anime musical. To oh yeah, it wasn't well. that one? Okay. Hey, from the chat, my interest in Daft Punk mostly came from Interstellar five 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 five. A lot of people's it was. Yep. Uh, that's when I I got a little interested in them. Yep. Um, so yeah, for, I can't remember which, one, which, what, which one it was. I cannot recall at all. Um, but he, he would know, but he's upstairs 
Actually, yeah, they're probably home. Yeah, I'm trying to think of how many films other than robots have cast entirely made of robots. Uh, well, I, I think honestly you could do you could you could probably do a fair job um with a robot centric well I mean bicentennial man is about a robot um uh, and that was that was pretty pretty endearing um there was another one that came out about the same time that was mostly about a uh, a robot um had Haley Joel Osmond in it um that AI AI um and uh yeah so I, th I think I think that there is, of course, Blade Runner is practically about robots. Um, but these aren't movies that have only robots. No, they don't they have only. Well, because the thing is, any any ro it's like a zombie movie, right? The zombies are the star of the show, but it's not really about the zombies, right? It's the same thing with like like uh, uh, Godzilla pictures, right? I mean, Godzilla is not really about Godzilla, but it is kind of about Godzilla. Right? Yeah, even like the um, the movie Nine. Uh, from 2009 uh, mm. technically the whole main cast are robots because they're created creatures by the uh, like the old architect or whatever in this post apocalyptic s uh, situation but I do believe there's a couple scenes where uh, you do see some humans in flashbacks uh, very very mm. very infrequently in the movie but what what I think is most because we look at those things as a reflection of our own being right um, so but to answer for this question I think that that I definitely think that you could look at um, an all robot movie depending on how the themes are laid out. Um, and I know that like when it comes to the idea of, of stop motion, like there are people that are huge stop motion fans. Um, probably yourself. Um, but I think that, that, that there could be a, an appeal on that as just depending on how the story shakes out. So, I, I mean, if, if you think you've got a really good story, I definitely think that it's worth pursuing at least, you know, getting the, the bones of it down. I mean, we've there's been really compelling comics told about, you know, sock puppets or about stuffed animals in a world of stuffed animals. So I, I think that 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 would be a perfectly reasonable way of doing it. So um, you're just saying as yeah. long as the main theme can consist of Yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, because it's really because the the, the so medium like Transformers would count. Well, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, like Transform, yeah, Transformers has always got people involved because of the way Transformers shakes out. But, but basically, if you replace people with other things, it's it's still basically a movie about people. They just have a different form, right? Like you, you do that with anything. Right. Land Before Time right. is a yeah. movie about people. They just have the yeah. form of these dinosaurs, right? Right. So, like, take or a look at Wally. what Wally is different because uh, Wally is, as a character, distinctly a robot. Like, he doesn't function the way you'd expect a person to, even though, in some ways, he's still more of a person than any of the people you see in the movies. Uh, but he is supposed to be in contrast to the way that society became. So that, that is a slight difference to it. Yeah. Well, and Wally functions as a robot, but he's a robot that's reaching for humanity, right? Yeah. Like, Wally, and it's, it's, it's actually really funny because, like, Wally's design is really seems really original until you go back to the last time that that theme was done as well, and that was short circuit. <laughs> and <laughs> Wally looks exactly like Johnny Five. Um, and uh, um, I think that's okay. Well, I mean, I think it's fine, it's just one of those things that that um, uh, that I think it's what it's fine, but it's one of those things where like. You look, think about robot designs and 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 Wally being so distant in space from from Johnny Five feels really unique um, and distinct. But then when you realize they're basically the same character <laughs> and are operating in basically the same <laughs> plot, and uh, not the same plot, the same with the same um, animating fo force, right? Um, they have the same kind of energy. They're longing for humanity. Yeah, the plot itself is very different. The plot is very the, different, um, but the, 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 the theme, the, the motives and stuff are the motive the of yeah. Johnny Five and the motive of Wally are mm -hmm. are, yeah. are very similar, and they've got the same look to them. Um, well, and I remember I didn't I didn't think about when I saw Wally when I saw the adverts I didn't think about Johnny Five, but then later on I I, I we looked up short we, we I think I had it and stuff but we watched short short circuit. 
they wanted to show Taliesin because he loves robots. And then I was like, wait, that that looks like Wally. How did I miss that? But here's the thing: if you realize that both Wally and Johnny Five, that motive they have is much, much older. Because in Short Circuit Two, he goes to a bookstore and he picks out two books: Pinocchio and Frankenstein. If you get my drift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's <clears throat> definitely a Pinocchio aspect to all of that. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, so to answer your question, Fizz, I think you definitely um, could make it happen. It just depends on how the story serves the the, the setting, um, and I think that's perfectly fine. So you know, figure out how you want to tell that, and and uh, I'd love to see that come to light. So, well, and circling around uh, since AI was brought up, AI is just a retelling of Pinocchio. They're not even ashamed of it in the the movie. Oh they're, yeah, they're all yeah. these Pinocchio uh, references. There have been more. Pinocchio films that I can uh, it's funny because I was just thinking about this yesterday how we were talking about public domain and mm. there is a public domain that has been going so much farther and bigger for decades now um, in which both indie and major companies continually get in on it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and no one bats an eye nobody yep. thinks of it as public domain Nobody thinks of it as something. And that anything that's myth is public domain. Like the, yeah. if you see somebody well, read something that's right. like mythological or in the extreme past, fairy tales, stuff like that, that you don't have the rights to uh, Fair enough. like actually hold down. That's always been technically public domain. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so here we question, um, uh, escape, uh, Claude says, it seems most movies need to relate something to the real world and not just indulge itself in being completely fantastical. I would agree, actually. Um, I think that's something that people... Um, I think it's a... It might be like a postmodern thing. Because I think it if is, you look at, at modernist and pre-modernist writers, they seem more willing to engage themselves in a fantasy world. Um, like I think specifically of um, uh, of Lord of the Rings, right? Um, where yeah. it's 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 Middle Earth, it's supposedly or or Conan the Barbarian, same one. It's you know it's the ancient past, sort of kind of. We're not married to real history. Them modernist writers, despite living in the age, they, though mm -hmm. both of those people are trying to be writers mm -hmm. of an older age than they actually yep. were. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. a lot of modernist people do this. But but what they would rather do is use this whimsical, fantastical setting as an allegory for the modern age mm. right uh, almost like an escape from it because you're almost like built down by modernism well postmodernism wants to try to bring that into their world which is mm. why everything has to relate to the real world well and, and, and it's be, and and the the irony about that is that postmodernists by definition reject absolutes and yet they still try to tie everything to their lived experience <laughs> um and uh, and that's one of the things that's like um, it's because they're well, materialists. I, there you go. Yeah. I think that's actually a really a really uh, keen way of, of of nailing that down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I, in the most literal meaning of it, because people don't understand what what you mean when you say that like somebody is a materialist in a sense. Uh, the people who have this kind of like deconstructive postmodernist mindset believes that everything is material because the material exists inside your head and perspective, right? Like right. nothing is real except for your experience. Mm. That, that's what and, it means to be in a materialist in a sense. Right, right. We're not talking about somebody who's, who's like, like fixated on material goods, yeah. but rather somebody who believes that all there is to the universe is matter. And so our experience of that matter is, is, is relative. Yeah. And so that, as and, opposed to separating your experience from being immaterial to what's going on. Mm, mm. Yep, yep, yep. And so rather than using your experience to reflect on a greater truth um, or to, to ex explore uh, an, an exterior, exterior reality, it rather becomes um, your interior reality. And that's the same way, like, like not, to, not to get too far into that on there, but uh, Rose Tico in um, The Last Jedi, right? Um, like she becomes the star of the movie. Uh, she sacrifices, she, she risks sacrificing the rebellion for her crush. Um, because her experience is the paramount thing and her, her affection is the paramount thing. 
uh, her as opposed to like her sister like almost in the face of her sister's sacrifice mm -hmm. who is like i'm sacrificing my life for literally everyone else in the goal that we're doing yep yep exactly the inverse of that um and so that's and that's and that's and that's how that would in, in, play out so um yeah and that's and that's one thing and actually i want to take some time to talk about this little this other follow-up claude you are a gold mine tonight um um, if you adapt something like a comic or a game or whatever, it usually has to be, what if those characters came into the real world? That's not just even an adaptation, right? That's even in the, in the, in the books themselves. There is this fixation on, on the reality of the world that they live in rather than on the rules of the world as it is, right? Like this whole argument about like Batman killing, that's been, that's been like the meme for the last couple of weeks, people reflecting upon the Snyder verse and all that kind of stuff. And, the uh, the question is very literally right is um, if Batman were real and it was in his power to kill the Joker who is a mass murderer um, or if the government refused to do it Batman would be morally justified in killing the Joker yes but we Batman is not real it is not acceptable for grown men to take the law into their own hands. It is not acceptable for grown men to dress up as a bat. Well, I mean, that was a little more. It's not acceptable to drive yeah. through a building, right? I mean, part, on the yeah. reg, on the regular metal, on the regular, you know, cosplay is different. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> even outside of cosplay, right? Like, if you wanted to be somebody who built up a community, I actually think this is something that um, Kickass Two does really well narratively. Is that I most of the superheroes? Well, I hated the first one so much. Um, yeah, but in it, most of the superheroes aren't actually fighting crimes or being vigilantes, and they're not really super, but they uh, they're just vigilantes. They're they're mostly running around doing errands for people to make a good image of it, right? So they're just people in costumes helping old ladies with their groceries and stuff like that. I, I think mm -hmm. that would be totally acceptable in the real world. I don't think anyone would have a problem. It, well, it's for more the fact that he's doing all these other things. And he's intentionally trying to have like this appearance of fear. That's why he's a bat. Uh, right. That makes it unacceptable. Right. Oh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I can definitely see where you're with that. I mean, like there are are charitable organizations that dress up as clowns or dress up as heroes or dress up as yeah. as as uh, as uh, there's in town. There's a local rockabilly club, and they get together and listen to '50s music and fix cars and then raise money for charity. Right. So <laughs> you know um, that kind of thing. They're definitely in costumes. You know. You have you know fifty year old women in poodle skirts for crying out loud, mm -hmm. but they're there you know to enjoy themselves and to kick around. It's a costume. Yeah, I, I, I do right. think it is because a costume is a type of uniform, right? Mm -hmm. So what matters more is not the uniform; it's what you do while you're in it. So then we go back to all the actions that Batman's taking while he's wearing this costume. Yes, right. Um, but it, also the idea about dressing up in a costume does put one into question, but one's ability to sense out propriety in a life yeah. is what I was mostly getting at with that. I was, <laughs> Ultimately um, what matters is not whether you wear the costume or not. It's whether your mother's name is Martha. <laughs> of course. So, um, but anyway, though, the point is though, is that, is that in the superhero universe, um, the, and, and Twitless had a great thread on this on, on, on Twitter a few months ago. Oh, because the back. suicide squad game. Yeah. I remember that. Right. Right. Thread. But yeah. part of his th point was if a, if a hero has to, to to submit to lethal force in a comic book universe in a superhero universe he has failed at being a hero right um and it's not because that's an actual argument about gun violence that's not what's going on here because we're not discussing gun violence we're discussing the nature of of the ideal of heroism and the nature of the ideal of heroism is maximum force meets maximum mercy right and that's the idea so we live in a world where gun play isn't necessary for heroes because they are superlative and it's a, it's a fantasy it is a metaphor it is not expected to be prescriptions for real life and um, i i agree with most of that mm -hmm. i think there's places I, I don't, in the universe for hitman yeah. or whatever yeah. too um for for having a i think you can in a superhero universe you can take a dark take on it but take no mistake that that there is a moral difference between tommy monaghan and bruce wayne Yes, yes. Right. Well, I'm saying like so. There's there still has to be limits, right? Because mm -hmm. there, if there are a certain limit, you stop being heroic if you're not willing to uh, to get somebody across the line. And we even see this in like the oldest hero myths. A lot of the old heroes were very, very merciful. That was like something that made them different than the people around them. But then, like, 
somebody would cross the line, like they're burning entire villages. Like I can't let you continue to do this. Right. And I think probably the series that handles this the best uh, is a Japanese series of, about pacifism and its trigun, uh, because Vash the Stampede has to go through that moral quandary of if I don't take this guy's life, other people, including people that are actually important to me in this moment, are going to die. There's literally no other option here, and it pushes his principles to the limit. Right, and and that's and that's an but that's another part of that world building piece, right? Yeah. So, um, so my and, problem with Batman is actually more the fact that it's been handed over to a bunch of writers over a long period of time, which period is a time. strength, yeah, yeah. but it's also a weakness to Batman. Right, too. right. But what I was going to point to is is Marmaduke fan had a great um, ob observation about this very topic. In, in looking not at Batman, but at the nature of Joker, right? Um, if we yeah. live in a world where the Joker is expected to be that Cesar Romero Joker, that, that Silver Age Joker, where he's got the specter of mortal danger, but he's not going around, you know, actively murdering everybody. Yeah. Then lethal force is not on the table. Yes, but if exactly. we expect Joker to be one who's where he's cut off and is wearing his own f rotting face as a mask, then suddenly not killing him is a crime against society and against him. Yeah, you actually right? kind of like, make the hero like, more of a villain than the villain if he doesn't exactly. actually do something if, if, about if, it. If, if 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 the Joker is Jeffrey Dahmer, right? It is it is criminal of the hero to not end that <laughs> and. And and that's and that's one of the one of the situations. And not that, you know, I, I I'm not trying to like say okay, like Jeffrey Dahmer was killed in prison. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, but I mean, <laughs> for whatever reason, these serial killers need to be stopped, and from killing, whatever it takes. Yeah, right. That's and the, I think part of being a hero too is that like the the ideal like the principle in there is still there even when they have to do it. So a mm. hero is going to feel remorse even for doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, sorry, I got distracted because I was I was checking out Claude's comment in the chat. Um, he says the first five minutes of Batman, the Batman Beyond pilot, had a smarter approach than any of Snyder's stuff. Uh, when old Bruce gets beat up by street punks and has to desperately grab one of their guns to hold them off, he's horrified that he's had to resort to that and is too old to be Batman anymore. And that ties directly into that to that comment that Twitless had made. Um, who's not, of course, here to say his own piece. But, um, but yeah, at that point, what you have is you have a situation where he's failed at that ideal, and therefore he's had to, he, it's time for him to step aside. Um, I thought that was, and also was one beautiful thing about that is how organically it left the ascendance of, of Terry McGinnis to that mantle um, to be something that, that was, was so welcome in that pilot. Such a good job. Such Although, a good job. to be fair, a pile of wet gym socks has more intelligence than any of Snyder's stuff. Just saying. I'm not sure that's true, <laughs> but it's not wrong either. If you guys um have a... To, to, to really understand my full... Because I don't know how this guy was got into my brain. But there's a YouTube channel called Belated Media, and he did a series of three Zack Snyder reviews called uh, Fun Time with Zack. And somehow that guy like, like got into my brain and pulled like every feeling that I have had about Zack Snyder and put him into these three videos. I don't know how he did it, but uh, um, yeah, that was definitely definitely worth doing. Yeah, this was trash. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely one hundred percent trash. And I don't know, I don't know if that was if that was like. Tim's idea or where that uh, Bruce Tim's idea or where that came from. I have but, missed this one. But yeah, yeah. It's don't it you're better off not even knowing about it. Forget the last three minutes. Just go yeah, about yeah, your yeah. day. <laughs> it's absolute garbage. Because right, it takes away so much. It's like so mm, much. So yes, much. I, I, I tampered like with some things <laughs> that I should not have tampered with because I'm oh, Bruce Wayne. It, the problem too meddled in God's domain. It is it is it's so wrong. But it was in line with the type of person that Bruce Wayne had become in that era and is still now, right? It's the same type of person of like Bruce who makes contingency plans for all of his friends and stuff like that, who just meddles in everything. And I hate yeah, it well, because 
up until that me. point, all of the Bruce Tim stuff had been like this amalgamation of older versions of Batman that makes like this really nice, true spirit of Batman character. It's like, no, we're going to give him some more like modern Batman tendencies now that we're in Batman Beyond. So here's a question for you guys. Um, where do you think, because I know where I think, but where do you think that Batman went off the rails? Because mm. I, I know I know you're not like metal, you're not the die hardest yeah, like, yeah. In American comics reader, but I know you've read enough. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm, I'm trying to think about that when it went off the rails, because I, I might know. even say mid to late 80s. Problem is, as much as I dislike, as much as I dislike Bruce Wayne as a person, and as much as I hate his no kill rule, there is something that makes sense. I think more than anything else about the Miller version of Batman, and I have never been able to get behind the people who say, "Well, like Batman should be someone." who can scare his enemies and then turn around and show kindness to a little girl. There's just something that makes more sense about Batman being this very single minded person with a family of other kids who have to pull him, you know, rein him back in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rather than him being this almost Superman version of a crime fighter. Well, I mean, I also, so, I, I don't really Frank, hate right? modern Batman per se. Mm -hmm. Well, and the There's a lot of things I, I had like, about I like him, Frank's... but stories but it, i like it better when it's taken as like an alternate direction for batman and not the thing that started influencing everything that happened after it well and the thing you got to remember there are two miller Three. batman oh, right oh, miller. yeah 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 uh batman year one batman and batman the dark knight batman are not the same no right well for that matter we can throw uh what is it all-star batman and rabbit in there the well, i haven't i haven't read that you are so I lucky Grant Morrison, I dislike <laughs> passionately. So, hey, Twitless isn't here to argue with me about that. Grant Morrison. No, but no that wasn't Grant Morrison. That was Miller. Was it? Yeah. I mean, sorry. No, not, 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 I thought that was Grant Morrison. Not I thought, he did, I thought he did Superman. both All Star series. No, no. But, Miller did All Star Batman and Robin, and uh, it was horrifying. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, have, I have not read it, so I can't comment. I can respect his earlier Batman. This version was like, the Joker in disguise. Mm. Once again, having not read it, I can't comment. But so I, I am. Here's the question that I have have uh, for you. Then, uh, 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 metal. You were saying you think maybe in the mid '80s that Batman yeah, went yeah. off the rails. I, I want to hear about that. What 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 where, 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 what gives you that? Where would he go from? Well, that? honestly, I also think in the mid-80s, most of their shit went off the rails just in general. Uh, aside from the fact that I like um, specifically the new Teen Titans, which starts at the beginning of the 80s, uh, everything else, I kind of want to rewind the clock back to like 79 and then just start fresh from there in a new direction uh, before the crisis, right? Like, I, I think that was crazy. But I, I can't really put my tongue on it. It's just... Bruce starts to feel like a dynamically different character around the time of the crisis and then going forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I get, you know, actually, I guess I can kind of see that, but part of where I'm, where I come from with it is that like I came into, came into reading comics in 90, right? Uh, 89, 90, somewhere in there, uh, superhero comics. And, um, and you got some such great Batman stories in the nineties when you got Alan Grant writing and Chuck Dixon and Doug Monk. And it's just some really, really solid stuff. And it very much has um, uh, the dynamics of that 1970s revival stuff with, uh, was it Engelhopped? And even back to the pre- um, 1950s Batman, that very serious tone. Um, and there were, there were other lightnesses that were in it, but I really enjoy, I mean, uh, um, there were a lot of serious things that were happening at the same time. And I thought they did a really good job of balancing those things without having a lot of the 1960s cheese. And even, mm, yeah, 
I, I think he, there's a lot of great stories during that time. Uh, mm-hmm. But like what I want to say, like going off the rails, this is just like the start of a cascade, right? Okay. So like, you have a lot okay. of really good things. And then it's just like slowly snowballing downhill over time until it gets bigger and bigger. And now Bruce is almost not recognizable to the uh, person he used to be without good justification to why he's not recognizable to the person he used right. to be. So, so yeah. Okay. So I could definitely see, I could definitely see an argument for that. They actually address some of those in like a lonely place of dying and in Batman year three, um, and in um, the 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 stories led up to to Dick, I mean to Tim becoming Robin, right? There are actually big themes that were put in place in there that were Batman working through the death of Jason Todd, right? Um, uh, and so I think that so that all made a lot of sense. And the thing I really liked about those moments and into the time, um, um, you know, after that. Um, pretty consistently on up to catacly- the cataclysm story is what you had is this softening of Bruce back to being a little more jovial, you know, around the Batcave and a little mm. less grim. I like cataclysm. I love cataclysm, yeah. right? But, okay, so here's here's what I'm saying, right? Okay, so so you had this, because there's, 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 I'm seeing, I'm seeing a, like a, a, a river, like a tribute, a set of tributaries in my head. So let me yeah, see yeah. if I can't explain this, okay? So you've got your core Batman books that are very heavily and overseen editing by Denny O'Neill. And Denny O'Neill had this very serious pre-Silver Age vision of what Batman should be, right? Shadow light kind of thing, right? Um, and 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 it had this, and that was, you know, no, no aliens, you know, yeah, we're gonna we'll, maybe we'll have some ghosts. But no aliens, you know, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Um, um, but but he was, but there was still a lot of the the overall arc of these stories had this this underpinning about you know while Batman is dealing with you know the caper of the week, he's also coming and going, dealing with these these. You see a man dealing with with these traumas and these these histories and kind of growing and developing through the course of it, which worked out really good when you had three solid writers who were consistently working these titles out. Right. Yeah. Who are also right. under the vision of one main editor. And they all shared this yeah. vision between them. Yeah. Right. So they, so that's one of the things that made like some people hate nightfall um, because it's such a, an omnibus giant thing. And because Gene Paul Valley is sort of a, of a, of a hit and miss character. Right. If you take it for what it is and you read the sit down and you read the whole thing, you can really kind of see how they how the 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 psychological storytelling really see really works. It really works, right? And I can understand people not liking the question, and I can understand a lot of like I I, I might be wrong on this. I think I think I think Twitless does not like Nightfall. I think I remember him saying that. Am I getting this confused? I thought Nightfall was Bane. Yeah, yeah, it was, but it was it was Bane, but it was everybody. Right, like Bane's first move is to break everybody out of prison, and so then uh, he, they they wear Batman down, wear Batman down, and Bane breaks Batman's back, and Jean Paul Valley Azrael then becomes the new Batman, and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> it's whole. It's whole. Well, I, I, I think I there's a problem. Is like. Again the general philosophy of Batman ends up changing over time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Part Mm -hmm. of that too is the hyper fixation on his trauma Mm, that goes more into, instead of being uh, trauma, it becomes actual like uh, psychological disorder uh, Mm -hmm. to a certain extent. And the, whether you know, a writer actually knows whether they're writing Batman correctly or not. You can ask the question is, what is Batman's major motivation? And if they say vengeance instead of justice, then they're mm-hmm. writing the wrong character. Right. See, and that but that's see, that's part of what I'm getting at, right? So um you have you have um you have the Dark Knight and you have Batman Year One, and you have these things that are happening on the, the outside of Batman, right? Then you've got these core characters, these core books that are following Denny's vision and are really consistent and are showing kind of development and growth. And, you know, the Bat family is getting rebuilt and people are having a chance to, to, to grow and learn about each other and all this kind of stuff. Right. And that's going on, you know, throughout the thing. But then you have 
other writers coming in on the outside and doing one shots and doing alternate universe stories and doing elseworlds and all that kind of stuff. And in those which can be stories, fun when that stays there, which can be fun. But what you have is you have all these other takes on Batman that are like you know more extreme or they're they're they're, they're whatever it is. So then, as Denny winds down his career, these other writers who were doing Batman Arkham or were doing all these other things, they're they are brought into the fold. And and instead of it being you know this, this these 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 you know mystery a month stories featuring a man dealing with his past and and growing through past it, which I was one of the things I appreciated about Batman. And at one point, I felt like he was in the core books. He was no longer growing past his past, right? Where where, yeah. where he was being defined by his past instead of growing past it. And it was one of those things where it went from Batman saying you know every once and again having like the pangs of missing his parents to every issue is oh i miss my mommy right and and which is where batman has been and i haven't the last time i was buying batman was was under tom king so i don't know if other writers i've heard other writers have come in and done a better job with it but i was yeah. just i just did the well, pilot like thing with that one of the reasons uh, up until he starts doing some of this modern stuff and i don't think it was tim because of a lot of beyond was done by a, a different crew of people mm. here and there like they had several writers on it right mm. but um in batman the animated series especially going to the movie mask of the phantasm which i really really enjoy mask of the phantasm it's excellent um, i think like he the understood best adaptation Bruce. of year one i've ever seen yeah <laughs> but it's uh he really understood bruce because there's a there's a point where he's like crying at his parents graves and it's not because he misses his parents like, mm -hmm. obviously, he does to some degree, but it's more of like he's doing everything for everyone else. You know, like his sense of justice. I want to make sure that other people's lives don't end up the way that mine did. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, but when do I get to be happy? Why don't I get to be happy is like why he's uh, crying. And like, that's a form of lingering trauma that I think would be with the character. Uh, mm -hmm. with everything that he's doing is like why why can't i get the same level of happiness that i sacrifice to, uh, for everyone else and part of that is the sacrifice and something that you have to like get over as a hero to a degree but that's just spider-man well i mean uh, kind of i mean i mean, I mean it's like also an older myth <laughs> yeah it's, it's been around forever yeah 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 and, and it's and it's it's you know and it's the whole the idea of the the uh the night of the realm, you know, you sacrifice yeah. your life for the sake of others. That's the whole point, right? The, the purpose like, of, the, um, of the primitive Heracles. king. Her yeah. Heracles is great as long as he's not doing things for himself. He finally mm -hmm. settles down and has a wife and uh, becomes complacent. And then Hera's like, ha, here's my chance, drives that's, into madness and he ends up killing yeah. his own family. That's that's John McClane. For yeah, that's, that's, wow. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've talked about that on the stream before too. Um, but um, the... Uh, when you think about it, modern Batman has a lot in common with Jason Voorhees. Yeah, I think you're onto something there, Fizz. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, but, but so the thing is, is so throughout the late '80s, right, and all through the '90s, we do have these. While the core books are telling this one kind of story, and they keep throwing traumas, whether it's Cataclysm, whether it's you know the uh, the the Contagion. Whether it's you know whatever it is the the the, the, the demon the sec, the third demon saga uh, they keep throwing all these traumas at Bruce that he's got to figure out his way through, and what you see is that he he's building this circle of support around him. You know he he reunites with Dick. Um, Tim is a major support for him. He you know he starts to realize what he has in Alfred again, right? And and so he's building this, this circle of support around him um, and to deal all with all this kind of stuff. Right, it's not well, like ling like this lingering trauma that's been forever, though it, it does play in it. Like there are fresh traumas being thrown at him, He's, you know. Right, right. But so then, then so that's all happening, and then I go to college, right, and and I'm homeless and I'm strapped for cash and I'm not buying as many books, and then I start coming back and around. Well, I, I'll tell you, completely, by the time. The Dio had control after Jeanette Kahn had retired and they did that, that identity crisis storyline. Right. And, um, and after that, like, like between how, and it's, it's not just that, but between how Batman was portrayed in justice league by Grant Morrison, the whole bat God thing. And the, 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 the absolute schemer, like malevolent schemer revealed in the wake of identity crisis. 
right? Batman has never been back to being like that core altruistic hero that I grew up with. And it's one of those things yeah. where it's like, he's just damaged goods. And he, even in the good stories, he's just damaged goods. Oh yeah. And Cause you, you only get two versions of Batman. Now you either get like that bat God, absolute power fantasy, uh, with enough preparation time, Batman can do anything, uh, mm -hmm. right? Whatever that actually means. Like, what does enough preparation time even mean? You have to, you have to be able to have the materials exist in the world or pre-knowledge. But it's a comic book, right? So, like, that yeah. version. But you also get, like, this useless Batman where everybody else ends up having to do everything for him. And there's no in-between. It's, like, one of these two or the other. Well, and ironically, ironically, the one recent Batman story I've read... That consistent, well, not even consistently, because at the end of it doesn't. There was a mini series. I bought the hardcover of it. I've talked about it. The friggin', um, I forget the name of the game. It's a, a Fortnite, Batman Fortnite crossover, right? Where the first half of it is just Batman failing again and again and again and again and waking up with no memory and having to recon reconstitute where he is in 12 minutes or whatever, you know? <laughs> And so you see Batman failing again and again and again and not being the, the dominant Batman. Yeah, yeah. It's Batman being... on the edge of tomorrow, basically. It's, and it is. And it's and it's and it's great because you get to see, you know, how he's leaving clues for himself and how he's he's getting other, you know, he's building his team around him. See that <laughs> yeah. his support structure and being able to relate to them in ways that like, oh, I wake up with no memory, but I know that I know you because I left myself a note and you know you know me because you left yourself a note and now we can go on to the next thing on our list, our little checklist we left last time, you know? And, uh, um, but like that was, that's, but it was cathartic for me to see Batman failing so often because yeah, yeah. you just don't see that. You either see Batman never failing in the hero stuff and always failing in the personal stuff. And, um, that's one of the things where it's just been so irritating about that book whenever I've picked it up because you've got that thing going on there. Um, and that's just not that's not the world that you know that I was that I grew up reading with with Dixon, Dixon and Grant and Monk writing it, right? Where they were uh, and the other some of the other guys before then too, where they were writing a Batman who was, you know, he would fail up until the end <laughs> of the story and you'd get to see how he picks himself up time and time again. And, uh, um, and so that was one of the things that I just, I just really enjoyed, um, about Batman was his humanity, yeah. but also how he was overcoming that both in the, in the professional realm and in the personal realm and in a way that well, was fun and like not a, overburdensome. Like a Holmesian style narrative with Batman, mm -hmm. which Holmes himself was constantly running into basically dead ends in every single one of his story, but the dead ends would lead him to the clues that he needs to ultimately piece it together by well, the end. Well, not in every one of his stories. No, there are most a couple of them. where there's a couple yeah. where where, where uh, Doyle was really phoning it in. <laughs> See, yeah. the stories I remember would actually revolve around Watson, and Holmes would like disappear for ninety percent of the story, and then show mm -hmm. up having figured it all out and just say, here's how I figured it all out. Yeah. Those are the worst ones. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mostly some of those stories, some of those ones involved such fun character moments that you can forgive the fact you're being cheated on the mystery, <laughs> but, but uh, Doyle would actually get letters at the time of people complaining that he was cheating on his mysteries. So I love all of the letters. Uh, you would get letters for that cheating. Also, get cheating on the timeline. It's like, hey, what order do these books come in? Because some of them clearly have to happen after mm -hmm. each other, but th there's no clear thing. It's like, oh, it's uh, whichever one makes the most sense to you. Yeah, like, yeah, he had yeah. no timeline yeah. or anything for that. Yeah. It was just writing things, and it's like he, he would so, always be making fans mad. Mm -hmm. um, to address back then, there were wars on lore. Well, and that's the thing. Nerds have always been nerds. Let's yeah. just face it, boys. <laughs> um, Fizz in the chat says, I think they're trying too hard to turn Batman into Spider-Man. Um, yes. And they're also trying too hard to keep Spider-Man, Spider-Boy. Um, uh, with that, both things are true. We're having problems where um, too many mod like this. Is and that was one of the things that was just different from when I was a kid was that DC, even though DC was moving into character centric stories, they still have this sense of like the mythic and the archetypical um, in the stories, even up until the early 2000s. Um, um, so you had this idea where Superman, well, in our current reading of, of the Superman series that Williamson is doing, it gets some of those same notes where he's just 
you know, better than a person could be. And he's not infallible and he's not perfect. And he's making a couple mistakes here and there. And some of them are really stupid mistakes. Um, but it's a situation where, um, uh, that, um, that still is dealing with these, these archetypical aspects of Superman. Um, but so many modern writers, they don't, they're not interested in telling archetypical stories. Cause once yeah. again, they're 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 they've been they they only understand postmodernist constructions um and i it's not necessarily even their fault like this is one thing that i i'm I'm trying on the regular to get my head around is the idea like i want to be really mad at people like tom king who can only tell one story and do it badly but tom king like is a product of his environment yeah, yeah. And we 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 instead of telling stories about truth, we've been telling stories about stories for for you know 30 years. It's like who is it? I, somebody was telling me, somebody was saying this. I can't remember who it was, so I can't credit them, but it's not my idea. I said it this way: like for the last 20 years, all anyone has done is written fanfic. Yeah, right. Um <laughs> nobody's actually telling stories they're just telling fans yeah, i've had that opinion for quite a while yeah and i can't yeah. remember who, who somebody told it to me in those words and i was like uh well yeah duh that's obviously what's going on why didn't i think and say it like that um that's interesting because there are entire um i wouldn't even call them ips anymore but uh because they're not copyrighted but they're entire sections of lore and storytelling that kind of owe their existence as we know them to fanfic mm -hmm. uh i.e king arthur yep yeah, well, most of like... the stuff we get really is people jumping on board and saying oh i want to throw my you know cool oh, yeah, original yeah. fan character do not steal in there mm -hmm. well even like the oh. um the most modern version of king arthur that we know or the one that's been around for the longest time is kind of a Norman fanfic of a Celtic tale that has a bunch of Holy Roman Germanic uh, influence on it because it's actually just Charlemagne and his paladins is mm -hmm. the version of King Arthur and the Round Knights of the Round Table that we know now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I mean, and uh, even if you even I mean, even like even more more currently, right? Like the the most popular, and this is this is absolutely crazy, right? One of the most popular books of the last, you know, dozen years was Fifty Shades of Grey, right? Which started out as a Twilight fanfic. Yeah. Which is a Twilight fanfic, but Twilight started as a Harry Potter fanfic. Yes. Uh -huh. And Harry Potter just cribbed J.R.R. Tolkien's notes for the whole story. <laughs> Harry, Harry Potter is original enough, though. Yeah. Like I, Harry Potter, I'll give a pass. The other yeah, ones is well, like we are derivations from derivations. Well, well, and part of the thing is, I'm, and the thing about Harry Potter, I say, I say that it's it, that he's cribbing Tolkien's notes. I'm not meaning that insultingly either. Like, like everybody, everybody who's anybody is going to pull something great from Tolkien. His stuff was deep. It was rich. The concept of deep lore was kind of reinvented in a lot of ways by Tolkien. I mean, he didn't, didn't come up with it wholly. Um, Robert E. Howard had a lot of that kind of stuff. The other stuff. So I mean, other authors too. But I'm not. I'm not trying to trying to just pigeonhole that. But the, the the fact of the matter is that he like redefined that in the public consciousness with how popular those books got. Um, but what what I what I do want to say about that though is it's that um, uh, Rowling was absolutely pulling things from from Tolkien, um, but she also had the the an absolute like draftsman's skill with the language like her 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 use of english and you can you can hate harry potter you can think that it's just the most derivative tripe but the woman can write a sentence right it's it's ridiculous oh, yeah. it's ridiculous how how well and people say that it was heavily edited or whatever fine but she still wrote the first book entirely right she sold that um her ability to craft a sentence is ridiculous. Well, and the language grows uh, with the audience age, too. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it actually mm -hmm. goes at a really good pace. Yep. So she's yeah. basically the anti-Stephen King. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, Stephen King can make a really good sentence, too. Mm. What, he can, what he can't do is end. He can't do his end of story. Um, 
especially anything long. I, the the uh, the best Stephen King that I've read was one of his novellas called The Gingerbread Girl, and even that one kind of cheats the ending. But it's only like yeah. 110 pages. When when it comes to actually the prose, though, Stephen King is a master of using the active voice. Mm -hmm. Like you're probably not going to find many better than him. I feel like he's this guy who always thinks he has these, and maybe he does, has these deep genius ideas, and he believes that he's getting it across. But in reality, he's the only one who actually understands what's happening here. Um, I actually think it has more to do with the fact that that he does. I don't think he thinks that. Well, I'm sure he thinks that they're genius, but I don't think he he really cares about getting them across. Right? I yeah. think that's that's part of the aspect and why he can't. He ever, writes like, in land the moment. The plane. Right, and that's that's the problem. Why he can't land the plane because he writes in the moment. So he'll have like this really great uh, idea of like, oh, I want this scenario and this setup, and it would be great for writing all of these like sub scenarios in it. But then eventually that has to come to an end. He's like, mm -hmm. okay, I can write a scenario that is the end, but is it going to be a good snap to the rubber band? And often it's mm -hmm. not. It's just yet another scenario in the story idea that he had. Right. Now, one of the best examples of that specifically is if you've ever had the chance to read Cell. And oh my God, I hate Cell. I actually dropped I... it halfway <laughs> through. And if you know which part I dropped it on, it's the part with the baseball bat. Uh, okay, I think I remember that part in in the bar, right when they're at the the like the truck stop or whatever. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah. They, like I, that's that's where I dropped it, and yeah. I didn't even find out the end to that story until the movie came out, and then I had to go into the book to check to see how close it was to the uh, the book ending. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, you don't. The thing is, you in the book, you don't get to the end. You never you get don't. To the end. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like the movie's actually better than the book, and the movie was bad. <laughs> uh, it's a Stephen King. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give the, 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 the elevator pitch. I think that one came out when I was in high school. It's a Stephen King novel about a uh, uh, a day where everybody who is, where, the, where there's a pulse and the world shuts down for five minutes and everybody who uses a cell phone likewise shuts down for five minutes and goes like catatonic. And then everybody who was using a cell phone wakes up and is a zombie. And this um, is clearly one giant metaphor, and it tells it, it and it tells the story of one guy who's trying to find his wife and kids, who wasn't using a cell phone because his battery was dead or something like that. He went down to call his wife, and the battery died, and then the pulse happens. If I remember the beginning right, um, I only I yeah, only, that's pretty much how it yeah. happens. And uh, and so then so he gets trying try to find his wife or whatever, and and uh, she's been turned into a zombie. Well, then. The zombies start evolving. Actually, if I recall, I thought it was, um, it was, there, he wasn't the only one, but most yeah, of the no. people who were unaffected were on airplanes because you yeah. had to turn your cell phone off. Yep, yeah, were on airplanes yeah. or, yeah. or they were, you know, just not using cell phones, right? It was, it was, it was, you know, he's definitely not the only one, but he's the, in his vicinity. And, but pretty soon, like the people who were, who, who had been zombies, they start developing um, more complex behaviors and none of them can speak, but they're doing comp and then they're they're fight go from fighting to cooperating and acting like they're all part of the same hive mind and then they start developing superpowers and meanwhile the the conscious humans are trying to find ways of getting to to uh, to, to find survival and and uh, I'll spoil the ending. there is no ending. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, surprise. No, like literally, like, like, okay, if you guys have any interest in like, you won't like stories being spoiled for you, I'm absolutely spoiling the ending of this. So just hang on. The main character just finds somebody out there who has determined that the pulse originated from one like cell station or radio tower or something in, in like, uh, I can't remember wherever his stories all happen, Maryland, uh, not Maryland, uh, Maine. So he's going to be hiking through the wilderness to get to the center of all of this. And he's discovered that all of the zombies are going there too. And so he's going to have his one last stand or try to figure out or shut off the tower and see if it fixes everybody or who knows what's going to happen, but he's going to do it. And the end. And <laughs> it was just like, the, the, that's not the end of the story. That's the end of like part one. Like, like, Maybe that was what he was planning on. I I don't know. Maybe he was planning a trilogy and 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 he got cut off because <laughs> nobody liked it. But oh, uh, I uh, 
<laughs> I was, I didn't even intend to like the book. Didn't like when I when I picked it up, I didn't buy it. I got it from the library. I got it as an audio book. I was looking for something to listen to while I was driving around Nebraska before, like streaming audio was a thing, right? And uh, so this is a lot of audio books that phase of my life, um, and um, and I was like, ah, uh, you know, so I've read a couple Stephen King things. Sure, what the heck? We'll go ahead and put that on this list, and. <laughs> <laughs> As I'm sitting there listening to it and I'm like like in, engaged and intrigued and the story's kind of moving along it's weird it's weird but okay we'll see you know but I you know it's it's because I was listening it's very low commitment right so I could definitely see uh you metal saying that's it I'm closing this book <laughs> this giant oh yeah 600 page tome of of stuff that is obviously going to not have a point and <laughs> <laughs> it to, to date is my my least favorite Stephen King book, like just period. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of my and least I like King. Books. Like it's one of I've my read least a lot of King. Books. I'll be honest, like the fact that it ended without an ending, and it's just like, oh, imagine what happens next. I'm like, you know what? Mm. <laughs> I got bad things to say about you, King. But not nah, Gingerbread Gingerbread Girl is really good. It's really really good. And it's short, so it's 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 uh it's and it's not as like a lot of his stuff um is like super like like mystical, spiritual, really high voodoo hoodoo, and gingerbread girl is just a basic crime story. It's 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 fun. It doesn't lean on the hoodoo at all, so I give it thumbs up. Anyway, and not that hoodoo's bad in the story, but it it you know it can be a real crutch for some things. So, <laughs> if I had written this story, the ending scene would have involved the guy making nunchucks out a couple of wired phone handsets to beat the horde of zombies. That would have been an ending, at least. <laughs> You're not wrong. Stephen King stories tend to have characters developing superpowers for no reason. Yes. And sometimes you don't necessarily need a reason, like the whole I don't know, what do you guys, did you guys, what are you guys thoughts on The Shining? I like The Shining. Yeah. Yeah. Though the, the reason for The Shining uh, surprisingly gets explained in another book series. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's connected to the Dark Sour, Tower series. Oh, okay. Yeah. They also kind of go over that in Doctor Sleep a little bit, or at least on explanation. Yeah. It may not be the explanation. But you but... see the same psychics in the Dark Tower, and they're actually the ones protecting, putting the barrier for the tower so that, like, the forces from outside of the universe can't uh, uh, knock them down because the towers themselves are a barrier for the multiverse. Yeah, I've had a lot of people say, "Man, you got to read the Dark Tower books. They're just great." I love the Dark Tower books, and uh, I, I just, I've just never been able to. I don't know something about the idea. Like it's intriguing, but it's intriguing in the way like I might read the Wikipedia article someday. I'm not sure I'm in just yeah. invested, in <laughs> right? Um, and that's not to say it's bad. I'm not trying to like rain on it. Like this dude who used to be one of my best friends was a huge Dark Tower fan. We'll talk about it all the time, and I would just be like, "Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm." <laughs> Well, I mean, the main character mm -hmm. is just um, Clint Eastwood. Like, literally, you just take the amalgamation of his uh, Western characters, and it's just that. That is uh, Roland Deschain, uh, and as the gunslinger. He's just Clint Eastwood. So then why was he played by Idris Elba? That was a big complaint that everyone had. It's like, you know who's... Uh, he does more directing than not, but who is an actor that looks exactly like Clint Eastwood? His son. Clint Eastwood's kid, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Scott? Is that his name? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Scott Eastwood. I mean, I Something think he's like got. That. I think he's got like several kids, but. Yeah. Let me. I, th I think that's his name. Let me look. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, that is the one I was thinking of too. Okay. Uh, he's says like thirty-eight. Heard... He would have been a great age at the time that the movie was being made. Yeah. Yeah. So Fizz says, uh, "I heard Brady Hartsfield became a psychic for no reason. I don't remember who Brady Hartsfield is. What name is not ringing bells for me." Do we freeze um, or okay? Oh, that's the main antagonist in Mr. Mercedes. Oh, oh, okay. Let's talk about Mr. Mercedes earlier. Yeah, I have not seen Mr. Mercedes. So 
Um, uh, Fizz says that was a show. Um, is it on a streaming service or something? See about that? I don't know. I, I mean, we can look it up. Remember. We have the internet. But yeah, we do. I'm not going to do it. So we have the internet. Oh, a stream. <laughs> Yes. But also after The Shining, and specifically after the Dark Tower series, because that explains the whole psychic phenomenon, mm. uh, technically anyone could become a psychic in his multiverse for no reason, and it's already explained. It just kind of sucks if you aren't immersed in his multiverse of stories uh, and exactly. don't know that reason. You're just re watching or reading some random uh, book or adaptation, and you're like, why is this guy a psychic? That don't make sense. It's like, well, I mean, technically anybody could. So most people are gifted with it from birth, um, but some people it's more latent, like it uh, sticks around uh, forever. So kind of the whole of Dr. Sleep, like he had it when he was a kid, but then it kind of became dormant and then he, it came back. Yep. Well, yeah, and there were there were kind of reasons, there were reasons for that in, in Dr. Sleep. Yeah, yeah, because his, his trauma buried it, so he kind of factor. lost the ability and I, to. Uh, and, I, uh, and I really enjoyed the film of Dr. Sleep. Uh, we, we, uh, um, um, we bought the 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 two pack of uh, Kubrick's Shining and um, Doctor Sleep, and I uh, really enjoyed Doctor Sleep. I thought they did a, a fun job of of making a sequel to Kubrick's movie that still while well, also well incorporating some of the stuff from the books that wasn't in Kubrick's movie. Yeah, I was going to bring like it's weird because it's both a sequel to the movie directly. And also the book at the same time, right, right, yeah. and uh, and uh, I and I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed that that piece. Although um, I know a lot of people did not like it, and it's very tonally, it's so tonally different. Um, but I still really enjoyed it. So um, take that for what it's worth. Just like McGregor, like I, I, he's, I enjoy his acting whenever I see him in anything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Passable in a uh, passable American accent, you know. So. So yeah, and I, he was also the best part of the of the of the Star Wars prequels as well. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Without without even questioning it, I, I even hated the uh, obviously like anyone uh, the Kenobi show. But there are select scenes that I'll go and I'll watch like the clip because the scene was executed really well due to him, mm. even though the show was trash. Yeah, I, I I don't want to give Disney any money, and I don't trust them enough. Yeah. To, so <laughs> I've never seen it. Money. <laughs> think I think I give Disney money. <laughs> You were more wily in the ways of the internet yeah. than I am. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I raise the sails across the mass, oh my. hoist the flag, and I watch anything I wish. <laughs> I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. Well, it's forever on the internet. So, or until they, you know, if my channel ever gets struck, but I don't think oh, that's going to happen. It's not like I haven't said it a hundred times in a bunch of other places either. <laughs> that's fair. But um, also my uh, my uh, I don't think anyone knows my show happens. So except for you faithful viewers out there, appreciate you guys going by. So we're at an hour and thirty. We could call it here. We're a lull between topics, or we can look for a question. Um. I, I don't have, I have not had a lot of time to do much comic reading the last week. I was going to ask if we wanted to talk about what we were reading. Yeah, yeah, I have, I, I, I just, I haven't really, I mean, like, I've got a couple of videos that I want to, want to do. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I got to read this from Nanji. Oh. A Stephen King novel, was it really good except the story just kind of meandered in the middle and then just ends? Does it have a weird sex thing to add it to the plot for no apparent reason? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, actually, um, that's one thing That's one thing about Cell, that there isn't that much weird sex stuff in it. By comparison. There's a lot of his books that don't have uh, any weird sex stuff, yeah. but it happens enough that it makes you think it happens in everything, and it really yeah, yeah. sticks out in your memory. There's the, in, in Cell, there's a lot of nudity and it's unnerving, but it's not, it's not, uh, there's not a lot of sex. So, but, and the nudity in cell, I, I don't believe has any actual, like sexual connotation to it. It just, it's supposed to be, hey, even most of the sex stuff is just supposed to be, um, unnerving period, mm -hmm. right? Like he does it for shock. Like that's the whole reason it's there. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, we have to, we have to, you know, keep the, uh, 
it only attacks children anyway um fizz says do you think a punisher like anti-hero fighting horny supervillains would make for a good story <laughs> <laughs> only if it's made entirely of, of doge dogs that's <laughs> call it bonk <laughs> too horny jail you go <laughs> too horny oh no that's where all the all you put all the horny people in the same jail. What will happen? Oh no! We're gonna just put them all on the same island. It's like you, you guys, you're not villains in this case. I mean, you're still kind of gross, but you know, you can just go do your thing, and we don't have to deal with you now. We'll have to deal with you. <laughs> um. Yeah, but then the, like two thirds of the internet would be on one small spot of the Caribbean. It's only if they're horny super villains. We're not going to throw every <laughs> horny person onto the. And this could be like almost everyone imaginable. It's just most people can control themselves. Yeah. Um. So could it make a good story though? Let me think about that. Um. I think you. I honestly think you could probably do like a satire story. I think the problem it depends on length. Honestly, that would whether yeah. it would be good or not because it's like a Saturday Night Live sketch, right? Like there's a lot of genius Saturday Night Live sketches that are a minute and a half, two minutes, three minutes too long, but so the joke is just spent. Um, and so then I once in that, a blue moon, you have something that's got real legs, like Wayne's World or the Blues Brothers, that you right. can do like a whole movie with. Well, um, to be fair, this is a real life thing, and they did make a movie uh, last was it last year, and it's called the uh, the Sound of Freedom. So, <laughs> just saying. Maybe no, not no, no, get actually, too there was close. a different one. I'm trying to remember um, what the name of it. There's this dude who uh, he was just like really, really upset with how much culture had uh, degraded, and he had like terminal cancer. So he was gonna go out and he was just gonna start like killing people. He was gonna like this big um, finale where he was gonna be on TV taking out like debauchery celebrities and stuff like that. I'm trying to remember the name of it because he ended up, there was this, like, this young girl uh, who ended up being like his sidekick in it. And it is oh, kind of like this satirical over the top. Oh, oh, uh, Punisher um, style. Yeah, it, yeah mm -hmm. that was a James like Gunn movie. America the um, Beautiful or something like, I can't remember the name of yeah, it. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it. It was, it was a James Gunn thing. It was Rain Wilson and... Uh, no, 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 that was a different one. Uh, oh, that also had a similar thing. Oh, yeah. Um, but that was... Um, I think it was just called Super. Well, that was with, with Rain Wilson and Ellen Page, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, but that's not the one I'm thinking of. That's not the one you're thinking of. Yeah, but that was a good movie, too, and it, it kind of falls I, in I really a disliked, lot of the same stuff. I really just like Taken. I really just like Super. Um, the, the, um, yeah. the, because, well, I mean, the, the thing with Super is it wasn't I, it wasn't the graphicness that I disliked. Was it called it was God the, Bless America? That might have been the name of the movie. That, that sounds like something I've heard of. Um, 2011 film. Yes, this is the film I'm, I'm thinking of. And yeah. in some ways, he I is mean, kind of like this... Uh, he's more of a villain than anything, but he, he has like this motivation that he's that fixing the, the American culture. So he um, he's just going out. One, he's like a Punisher-style one. Is that the one? Actually, I think maybe... Um, cause, uh, Got Bobcat. Bobcat, uh, that's what I'm saying. Bobcat it, yeah. Goldthwait direct, wrote and directed a movie. Is that yeah. the one? Okay. Yeah, it's starring uh, Joel Murray as uh, Frank. Okay, no, see, see that yeah. one That one I, I liked better than Super because... The, oh, no, I, I did too. I thought it was a much the, better the movie. Problem but that, that is had, kind of somewhat what he's talking about. Like, it's that theme yeah. of a story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and the, the, problem, the problem that I had with Super um, was that it made religious impulse um, look like mental illness. Um, yes. That, that was... Um, and even though, like, at the end of the movie, because this man follows his, his moral code, even though it's twisted, he's able to save the girl, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and to save his wife um, from, in, from the... Uh, it's, the like, it's the story of Hosea, the prophet, if he was, you know, an anti, a killing antihero. And, yeah, uh, and I think there is room for the story of not mm -hmm. that religious impulse is mental illness but mental illness could give you something akin to religious impulse mm -hmm. it, it's how you frame it and i i do agree that i just don't think it was framed properly well it's partially because i don't think the writer wanted yeah, to it, frame it differently. james gunn is a godless reprobate yeah. who thinks that raping kids makes for a funny joke um not literally but talking about it makes for a funny joke yeah and and so like i mean the 
yeah, I, I have no respect for James Gunn um, at all. Um, so to answer your question, Fizz, I definitely think it depends on how it's being done. Um, Whether you're looking at sat satire and like the 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 Bobcat movie, um, God Bless America was um, uh, was a, was I think a better study of that kind of thing. Um, even though it was a, it was, I didn't I still didn't like that one. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you why I don't think Fizz's idea is good. It's not that the idea is not good. Like you couldn't have the idea. It's because Fizz is the one with the idea, right? I'm, I'm gonna be a little mean here because he tells me a lot of his ideas and he'll he'll send me like drive docs and stuff. And the thing is, he comes with most of these ideas up out of spite, right? Like that's like the whole driving thing. And Whoa. they're they're usually like they're they're hate stories, right? He's he was like, oh, I want to write this story where I really hate this one author who uh, this one mangaka who makes like isekai stories, and I hate all the characters in it. So I want to make a story where this character goes around and kills all the the characters from that story. And like, yeah, you might find a small niche audience for that, but like, I just I don't even know if you'll ever develop the chops to write something like that properly co properly coming from this direction. Well, I can't make that yeah. comment because I've not read any of his stuff. But um, I, I do know that, like, that's that's the that's the the danger with that kind of thing is it can just seem. Um, I mean, it's it's gonna be mean spirited, right? Like Lady Ballers, is, and I haven't yeah. seen Lady Ballers, but like Lady Ballers is mean spirited, right? There's there's no question about that kind of thing is mean spirited, but that doesn't mean it's what's what's a really good one that I've seen that I can well kick ass, right? Yeah. Kick ass is it's not that story, but it's that same kind of like we're gonna we're gonna. Um, you know, uh, make fun of your stereo of your of your of your culture. We're going to make fun of your. Um, uh, it's 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 intended to 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 tell a crappy superhero story, um, uh, that is is mocking the very premises of superhero stories. Yeah, um, yeah. But when it's his culture, I, and, and, it's fine. And, and like, he goes why, and like, does the Kingsman, which is very much more of like a uh, a UK style story, mm -hmm. and he he does that justice because that's his culture. But when you go over and tell a story from mm -hmm. different cultures, like I kind of have right. to shit on. So it. like I I I dislike Kick Ass because you know superheroes mean so much to me personally, um, because I I believe the importance of that mythology is is vital, um, but it was still good. I mean, I mean, like it was, it was well acted, it was well performed, it was well shot. People, other people that don't think about superheroes, I think about superheroes yeah. enjoy. Well, it. I even think the source material so. um, uh, is also still good. It's just mean spirited. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, like I said, it's it's definitely mean spirited, but that doesn't mean it's not. It, you can't have some quality behind it. But there's um, also somebody who's developed his writing chops over many years before he started doing individual things. Like, that. yeah, well, I mean, and you look at like you know. Um, uh, the any of the you know kills the Marvel Universe stories that have been out there like Punisher kills the Marvel Universe or whatever like those are I hate are, most of those <laughs> well yeah but I mean the the fact of the matter is is part of why there is part of what what hurts those stories isn't the concept of it it's the it's the scope of it right it yeah. should be like a twelve page Mad Mad Max comic I mean Mad Magazine comic not a you know a a, a eighty a sixty eight page special. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, um, E. Nelson Bridwell did exactly the same kind of thing with less lethality in the pages of Inferior Five, you know, and it was just, it was small and it was funny. Um, and it, because it was part of it, it has to be the scope. So that's part of the, the ability to tell that kind of a, of a mean spirited story comes to the knowing how to handle your, the scope of your thing and knowing what, um, when the deconstructions, um, I also think that, like they... any story, right? You can have a good idea. And I think mm -hmm. like emotionally, Id ideas that come to you should be driven emotionally. But after you have the idea, you need to take a step back outside of yourself and you have to look at this from like an outside perspective. Like how are other people going to interpret this, right? Uh, like a lot of, I, I have, I'm in my own stories a lot and I have to step outside to make sure it's like, is this character fun <clears throat> despite me? Right. Well, and that's you know? one thing. Like you talk about self inserts, a lot of young writers, um, and some old writers too, they have this propensity to write themselves in because it's part of their own imaginations. Um, and that was a real trope in early web comics where you know the author would show up at sometimes. Um, but um, the 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 challenge, I think, is part of it is 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 it a situation where you're getting enough context to even explain that, right? If nobody yeah. knows that it's a self insert. Does the story still work if it's just some random dude, 
right? I and think that's also, part of does it. it matter if a character is a self-insert if nobody knows? Right. Yeah. Like, and in the same context, like there's a, a lot of um, Hemingway's characters are basically just him in the story. But like mm -hmm. most people at the time didn't know that much about Hemingway because like his exploits were more of like other people's stories later on that got collected. So mm -hmm. the average person like, oh, that's just an interesting character in his story. It's like, yeah, it right. doesn't matter if it's a self-insert if you don't know. <clears throat> well, yeah, definitely. I would. Uh, that's that's uh, that's something that would that I would definitely point to. Um, and uh, and once again, I mean, the I mean, if it comes to something like like Fizz's concept, I would think that it it also depends on what the point of the story is. I mean, if if it's just a matter of to you know to show people being gruesomely killed, well, some people enjoy the gore for comedy's sake. I mean, like that's the the point behind the Evil Dead stuff, and I I I I don't dislike that. <laughs> I uh, even Ash vs. Evil Dead, the TV series, which is ridiculously gory, uh, I still really enjoy as a study of of of, of maladaption. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you look at I like how that one. Uh, there's a better series that uh, does a lot of the same stuff um, with uh, uh, John C no, no, is McGinley. It's with McGinley's in it, right? Um, the guy who played Doctor Cox in um, Scrubs, and he's been in a bunch of other stuff too. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Um, he was in the show. Scrubs. Yeah, I know you don't care for Scrubs. That's just like, that's one of the first things I always think of when I think of him. He was also the cop in um, Wild Hogs. He's Wild Hogs, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he plays a character named Stan, who is the sheriff of a town in a show called uh, Stan Against Evil, right? Like you're standing against evil. And the town is like cursed. Uh, by these witches during the witch trials like way back in the day and it was like the sheriff who ended up burning all the witches so they're like oh these monsters and witches are going to come after you for the rest of ever and he's never dealt with it because while his wife was alive she was a modern day witch that was secretly protecting him from all this stuff and then on the day of her funeral he gets attacked by the first witch but he also kind of like retired from being the sheriff and a new person took over and now he and the the new sheriff have to like work together against and it's very very schlocky very grindhouse it's it's stupid and it's great and i love it i think it was um it was like on stars at the same time that ash versus the evil dead was oh going that out. So sounds like a competing show uh, and that sounds really fun yeah, did you see speaking of something kind of in that vein um but not because it's not really supernatural but uh did you see stan and tucker versus evil Dale, Dale, Dale and Tucker. And Tucker. Yeah, 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 Dale and Tucker. Yeah, yeah, I love that movie. That's one of my favorite movies. Uh, I actually recently re rewatched it with a bunch of people who've never seen it before. It's and so it's good because the whole thing's and... about like misconceptions and stuff. Yeah, it's. But it's then so also good. that one guy is actually just like messed up and evil. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, and it's great. Well, the thing I okay, the thing that I one of the and things I love I about it, I'll I watch don't like know anything if, he's in. I don't know if they did it on purpose, right? But. Dale and Tucker are these like redneck idiots, right? But despite them getting in the middle of all of this, they're like so good hearted. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. They're like they're the, they're the best people, people ever. They're, they're not smart. They're not sophisticated. They don't know what's going on around them. They're, they're well, absolutely. Well, it depends what you use the term, too, right? Bubble fox. Because um, <laughs> Tucker, Tucker is smart. He's just yeah. not learning, right? Like he, he can memorize all this okay. trivia and stuff, but he just hasn't yeah, yeah, yeah. gone through like schooling and everything. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. They're 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 unlearned. That's that's gonna be better. But the the beauty of it is is that they're generally good people. And it was when I watched this, I had been I had been like, I had been noticing like the thirty years of of Hollywood just like making fun and only making fun of rural people, right? And I had noticed that and been burdened by it, right? And this and, is like the most good spirited version of that, right? Yeah, like where it's absolutely yeah. it's like Beverly Hillbilly's level of, of yeah, yeah, yeah. Where where I mean it's in an R movie, but it's it's that idea where like these are they're 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 good people and they want to be great people and they don't know how to be great people. Maybe they'll never get there, but they're consistently good people. Um <laughs> and they're just like the heartbroken by like everything that happens in the movie, especially like the, the kid who falls into the wood chipper and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. oh, such a good movie. Yeah. I recommend it to like anybody who's never seen it. Yeah. No, it is, it is, it is very graphic. It is gory. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. quite, it's, it's not as gory as Ash versus Evil Dead, 
So yeah, and like there is some um, there are moments they do go like skinny dipping at one point, That's but I, it, it's also in the dark. I don't think it's too bad that if accompanied with the parents, certain younger audiences. But I would definitely say parental guidance. So like probably no one under thirteen, and you have to know your kid if they're ready to watch it or not. Mm-hmm. Yep, it yep. is an R-rated movie, though. But that's why I'm, I'm putting that. Like, you just have to know your kid whether they're ready for a movie yep. for, like that or not. Yeah, and and you know, we didn't show any of that kind of stuff to our kids. I don't think they've still seen that one, but um, yeah, not that way. Not that I'd have a problem with them watching it at this point. They're both, you know, in their twenties, but um, yeah, that's that's up to them at this point. <laughs> that's up to them at this point. But I mean, we watch we watch movies together because they're still living at home right now. So, well, it's definitely got... a movie saying even if you know your kid, you probably shouldn't let anybody under 13 watch that yeah, yeah yeah i had a i had a situation i mean it's one of those things where it's like oh wait i was thinking because every once and again um i'm sitting there because they're like in college right now so um, they're still at home um but it's been one of those things um because i don't want them to be as poor as i was i don't have money but i have a house um but uh anyway back to the back to the thing is so i'll be sitting there and thinking man i really want to watch blade oh the kids are wait the kids are grown. Hey, kids, you want to watch a vampire movie with lots of death and blood? And just a little bit, just, just a little bit of sexual innuendo. What do you think? <laughs> it's weird being a parent of an adult. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very big change. I'm sure it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Big change. Um, Fizz has commented. Uh, the reason I keep thinking about these stories is that. And uh, shaming Nazumo Tamaki as I read his superhero story where a heroine commits pedophilia and incest. And I can definitely relate to that being a specific problem um, emotionally. That was one of the things, not those specific issues, but it was those kind of things that really, one of the things that really made turn my stomach in super is that uh, yeah. Alan Page's character rapes Rain Wilson's character. Mm-hmm. And that was one oh, of the Oh, it's a disgusting that, movie. Oh, it's, it's a horror. Yeah. 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 Um, and it was it's played up as a bad thing in the movie. It's not glorified yeah. or anything, um, but it it did it did uh, make me real. It, it's supposed weird. to leave a pit in your stomach. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. thing is, like, do you necessarily want that pit in your stomach? Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like I said, it's mm-hmm. it's basically a superhero, like a modern day superhero pastiche of the story of Hosea. Yeah. And um, that's not. That story deserves better than that treatment. Oh, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> okay. The, here, the, here we go. A one story I seem dedicated to telling is one about a bunch of regular people trying to kill evil magical girls. Um, I think that could have some legs. Oh, um, it could. Uh, yeah. It would, it would basically be like um, a, the boys situation to some right. degree. The, the question is how strong are the magical girls? Mm-hmm. Because... Magical girls range everywhere from street level mm-hmm. fighters to I, I could destroy God. an entire universe, yeah. like, like literal gods. And just like, I don't, well, I don't I know mean, if regular people necessarily could kill like Madoka from Madoka Magica after she becomes a witch. Like, well, and, well I might I point out that to, you'd have this to, is also just the movie Hocus Pocus. I haven't seen Hocus Pocus, so I can't comment. Neither have uh, I, but I know um, what it's about. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen the movie, but this is basically the movie. <laughs> okay, of, sure, whatever. Um, a bunch of regular people trying to kill evil magical girls. Yeah. So, um, the the the, the situation yes, is kind of a stretch. I think the thing you'd have to do mechanically for a story like that is you'd have to spend enough time developing um, the magical girls characters mm-hmm. as well as the normal people that you'd um, leave like clues to how they're defeated. Yeah, along the thing like breadcrumbs. So yeah, like they could have specific weaknesses, and like even though this person's practically a god because I did this, that person mm-hmm. ended up dying. It could be like Balder with mistletoe. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would just be a situation where you'd have to ha- you'd have to sprinkle those throughout the, the na- story of the narrative, um, and have to have also a reason why the normal people would know that thing about them. Like, are yeah. they are they are are is this like a set of do, of like a fraternity that's been like chained up as slaves of these girls and they're sick of feeding them grapes or whatever, right? Especially because uh 
you could easily put most magical girls in the overall vigilante uh, classification. Mm -hmm. Most mm -hmm. of them have secret identities. And uh, a lot of times the magic, kind of like Wonder Woman's tiara or whatever back in the day, kind of stops people from recognizing them even if they look remotely the same as they normally do. Mm -hmm. Yep, 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 yep. So, cool. Well, there you go. That's that. It's been two hours. It's been a show. Um, I think, I'm not sure, next week... I will be 46. And um, I believe that um, we are going to be looking at Superman number 11 next week, I think. Yeah. Um, that was the original plan for today. Mike couldn't make it. I didn't want to go without him um, because he's been enjoying the series so much and we've been enjoying having him. Um, and Logan couldn't make it. So backup plan didn't happen either. So this was the third choice on there. Uh, hopefully you guys out there in internet land have enjoyed it. Um, that we have something else to say. Um, yeah, so I think that is uh, that's the story. I will say, if you guys happen to be following our Patreon, we are releasing two new stories on Patreon um, that are that are that are getting the first look um, for um, whether you follow us on Patreon, us uh, Ideal Comics, whether you follow us or um, support us on Patreon. Um, supporters get um, day of releases and um, followers get uh, a week later on those. And we are doing a two series. One is a Joe Jobs um, uh, Meet Cute, which is a little five page vignette story with art by everyone's favorite Evie, um, um, also known as, as Joy. And uh, she, um, uh, who did our the the matriarchy logos that show up every once and again the, the headshots and stuff? Um, so she did those, and um, and she's doing the art for the story. Um, five pages plus a cover. It's going to be dynamic once it's all released on Patreon. That will be put on Global Comics as well. Uh, we are also updating new pages for Grab It, the Rabbit Hero. The first seven strips are on Global Comics right now, um, but starting on Monday. Um, they will be dropping um, for public for uh, uh, a patron consumption week at least weekly. There are eleven new Grabit strips that are that I just got the art back on, and those are done by my boy. So I'm pretty happy about that. Which, if you don't know, Grabit is a a a uh, a funny animal hero in the world in the, the ideal comics world, and uh, it's. Uh, it's it's super fun little little, little uh, comic hero strips. They're funny, they're adorable, and there's also some solid action coming in. So I'm, I like it. Um, and uh, and so those are those are that. And uh, the Joe Jobs is the story of Greg from Force of Good and Evil after high school, working at a series of of crap jobs. And Meet Cute is uh, one story that happens amongst several of these crap jobs. So uh, that, that's what those are. Um, and yeah, that's the stuff. We've been working on that. Plus new force page, forces page coming hopefully Friday to the, uh, the webtoon for that. So that's what I've been working on in my spare time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been working on a lot of stuff. Most of uh, some things are secret right now. I'm working with an artist on something and it'll be pretty fun. Um, but over on uh, the Ex Dynamis Chaos website, I had been re uploading all of the, the web novel chapters for Ex Dynamis mm. Chaos. Yes. Well, yeah, uh, just because they were a pain to read before. And listen, I, I do editing for people as a paid job, but editing yourself is the hardest thing in the world because you're just so used to looking at it that even going back through, you end up missing things. So it's given me yet another chance to edit the story uh, for like my fifth or sixth time. Uh, uh, so people can read that. I, I still need to finish getting caught up to where we are. But I also have a page of X Dynamis Chaos that's been inked, started flatting, that's been sitting on my computer. I just don't want to finish and upload it until I'm done with all those chapters because I'd rather them all be back to back on the upload order than the next page being like randomly sandwiched in between. Fair, fair. Indeed. But I got a lot of stuff going. 
So how about you, Cartoonicus? Have anything you want to share before we call it done? Um, a lot of secrecy right now as I'm trying to finish up the game. I will just uh, share my DeviantArt and ask people to uh, who are interested to uh, follow the production on it as we go. I recently uh, hit the milestone of 500 subscribers, so that was nice. Nice. And that's there on DeviantArt. Mm-hmm. And we've got the link down there in the chat for you guys to click on and give uh, a, a cartoon kiss a follow. I'm on DeviantArt too, but I never share anything. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've got two because I've got one that's for X Dynamis Chaos as like a brand. So that one often gets more uploads, but I've got my older personal one where like something mm. if I do a commission or fan art or something like that, that just gets thrown over there. Yeah, I'll put fan art up there, but I don't yeah. do a lot of fan art, so <laughs> I'm not very good. Although the last, like, I think probably the last fan art I finished was the uh, Burger Time, uh, which is a uh, sock baby, the Doug Tanepa mm -hmm. sock baby fan art that I did about four years ago now. <laughs> I'll say now you're gonna have to give us your link because I'm curious. I'll I'll, I'll 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 put it. I'm not gonna put it in the chat. I have to look it up. I'll put it in one of our one of our <laughs> chat, our Facebook group or whatever. But I've I've put that around Twitter every once and again. But yeah, so there you go. That's the story. That's the ticket. That's the the tale, the legend, the dream. And until next week, get out there and don't do what I did last week. Go out and read some comics. And you guys have a great weekend. Happy yeah, Easter. Go read, um, go read uh, Rumiko Takahashi's Mao. It's been running since uh, 2019, and there's like 222 chapters of it. It's great. Awesome. Go out, get out there. Happy Easter, everybody. Take some time. And uh, uh, you know, uh, very soon we can celebrate the, uh, the resurrection of our Lord. So anyway, you guys have a good one. Have a nice night. Bye. Have a good night.